and welcome. I'm Barbara Lane. I'm the director of events at Copperfields Books. And on behalf of Copperfields and the Charles Schultz Museum, I want to welcome you to this afternoon's program with Patricia Marks and Roz Chast. Thank you so much for being here. So this is going to be a really funny afternoon. I am the least funny thing that's going to happen. So just bear with me for a moment. Um, I want to let you know about a big event that Copperfields is sponsoring coming up May 20th at the Luther Burbank Center. Stacy Abrams, who came with almost the governor of Georgia, uh, being talked about as a Democratic presidential candidate, will be appearing at the Luther Burbank Center on May 20th. So just go on the Copperfields website or Luther Burbank, and you can get your tickets, because that's going to be a really good one. And I hope we'll see you there. Uh, Roz Chast and Patricia Marks will sign books following our program today. There will be a book signing table set up in the lobby. So you already have your books. You have Patricia and Roz's new book, if you're sitting here. But there's the opportunity to buy other books by Roz Chast as well. So we hope you'll take advantage of that opportunity. And we thank you for that. And uh, now for this afternoon's program. Patricia Marks has contributed to The New Yorker since 1989. She's a former writer for Saturday Night Live and Rugrats, and was the first woman elected to the Harvard Lampoon. Her books include Let's Be Less Stupid, <laughs> and Him, Her, Him Again, The End of Him, and Starting from Happy, a Novel. Roz Chast is best known for her cartoons that appear regularly in The New Yorker. Her books include What I Hate, From A to Z, <laughs> Going Into Town, A Love Letter to New York, and, we, and Can't We Talk About Something More Pleasant. Please join me in welcoming Patricia Marks and Roz Chast to the Charles Schultz Museum. for joining us uh, this afternoon. Um, we are going to talk about mothers. And uh, we're going to talk about this book that Patty and I collaborated on. And uh, it's called, Why Don't You Write My Eulogy Now So I Can Correct It, A Mother's Suggestions. And uh, could you? My, my mother said that, although she told me uh, recently that uh, she doesn't want credit. And it's too late for that. <laughs> um, what are mothers for if not material? Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, and speaking of that, there is my mother and my father. I think you know which is which. And uh, they're larger than life, which is the way I, I thought they were <laughs> when I was growing up. I think uh, that's sort of the way it is for all of us, maybe. Uh, Scary to have them over your shoulder, <laughs> always, metaphorically and literally here. Um, and this is my mother. Um, this photo was taken in about 1883. <laughs> she is uh, wearing a pin that we're trying to decipher. Um, I think it says millet. And, uh, <laughs> How she loved that grain. She, that was her favorite <laughs> grain. And I think it was in, in my family, yeah. millet was yeah. the sort of. We were great. a barley family. Yeah, yeah. But in our family, it was, it was always millet. <laughs> um, this is, I'm including this because this is actually our very first collaboration. And it's also sort of how we met. Right. Um, when, when we were about, and in the title of this, oh, okay, what, um, we, uh, Patty wrote an article for uh, the Atlantic Magazine. It was at the very start. It was, it was the first thing I ever had published, and um, interestingly, it still kind of applies. Um, <laughs> and Roz did the illustration, and my mother called and said, that's a great illustration. You should meet the illustrator. 
Well, that's not something people do. So, but she said, call her up and introduce yourself and you'll be friends. It's sort of the way your, <laughs> your mother would say, she's six over there on the playground. You're six. Go play together. <laughs> Patty, so, yeah, she, Patty's mother basically set us up on a play date yeah. when we were like 23. And so I did, and so we got along, and so we're still playing. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm going to show some slides from the book before we get into the conversation. <laughs> this is uh, one of Patty's mother's sayings. It's absolutely true, I think. Humming is hostile. Um, you know, have you ever, like, you know, been with your mate and it's like, <laughs> is something wrong? Oh, no. Just don't talk to me. I'm humming. I'm humming. Uh, never serve salmon when entertaining. It is boring. Um, boring was bad in my in my house. And even though we like, I order salmon all the all the time. I'm aware how boring it is. Yeah. Uh, nature, if seen at all, is best seen from a car. And really, who could argue with that? I mean. That is absolutely true. Right. We, we're, we're, we don't really walk on grass for us. No, no. I had a... We, we have a friend we were with, and <laughs> we were driving kind of in Long Island or something, and the friend said, look, a picture of a deer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I had a cat once that was an apartment cat, and the cat, we took it uh, to the country with us on vacation once, and the cat walked on grass for the first time and got a grass allergy. <laughs> <laughs> you trained it well. Yes, exactly, exactly. Uh, girls named Susan are full of confidence. Uh, are you with Susan? Yeah. <laughs> okay. You're well, Susan? Yeah. yeah, that's... Uh, oh, we have a lot of confident people in this audience. Uh, if you see this, this boring thing, yeah. it's true, your mother hated... If you're writing a novel, I'll tell you what to do. Don't make it boring. <laughs> this is uh, very good advice. Quite what Hemingway had in mind. This little My guy. mother had two other other oh. book pieces of advice. One is, if you're in a book club, don't select Absalom, Absalom. It will break up your book club. <laughs> it broke up hers and two others. Yeah. She also, and I, I don't recommend this, or maybe I do. She said, read the the last sentence first, so you know what you're getting in for. <laughs> and you're not worried. She didn't like to worry. Yeah, being bored or worried, it's sort of like equally bad. Uh, I, this was actually, never wear red and black together, or you will look like a drum majorette. I think this is, this was the quotation from Patty's mother that when Patty told me about this, I sort of visualized it so clearly that I think this was when I wrote and I said, you know. I think it, when it was the first cartoon you drew for this book, right? Yeah, yeah, it was the first one because I just knew, you know, this, this is, and it's sort of true, too. <laughs> sort of true, although on this trip I brought red and black leggings and, and they've, nobody's, uh, no bands have followed us. <laughs> There's also another wonderful thing in the book about plaids should never be based in white. And it's absolutely true. Like, when I think about like, pictures like in a catalog, like pajamas or something, I think, oh, the blue ones are kind of nice. Red ones are kind of weird, not my favorite. And then you see the white, and it's like, who thought of that? That's disgusting. That's a, <laughs> such a horrible idea. Yeah, and who forgot to color it in? Yeah, yeah. It's like, who thought that was a good idea? And so there were some of these, some of the quotations in this I thought were you know, just more funny. And then some of them were like, uh, absolutely true. And some of them are yeah. wrong. Yeah. Uh, you don't need to spend a oh, lot of yeah. time in San Francisco. <laughs> it's all frosting and no cake. <laughs> but it doesn't apply to Santa Rosa. No, no. We worried about this one. Yeah, we do. Um, if you run out of food at a dinner party, the world will end. <laughs> but don't go overboard, or your table will look like a Las Vegas buffet. <laughs> there's a lot of things there. I think there's salmon on that. There it is. Yeah, there's definitely salmon. Redheads are extroverts. <laughs> uh, 
Mike says you can only get a Dalmatian if the spots are <laughs> symmetrical. And, <laughs> who is this Mike guy? <laughs> Mike was a really, is a very good friend of my mother's, and he has a very good eye. He can, he's very good at arranging furniture and knows what dog to pick <laughs> based on looks, which is all he yes, cares about. Yes, yes. The dog is a little, has a little bit of a sad face. Well, how, yeah. how would you feel if yeah, your spots it's were symmetrical? Like I'm just, I woke up like this. <laughs> all the dogs should be told just with a little white out and magic marker. Everything oh, I know. It could work out great. You go to like a cosmetic surgeon for dogs. Yeah. Um, I'm going to show a few cartoons here <laughs> from New York. This is Mother's Day card. She looks like she can't decide because yeah, they all apply. They all <laughs> exactly, exactly. She should buy them all. Um, this is Mom's mortuary. Um, he never should have divorced his first wife. I heard all of these from my mother. Um, she was a floozy, and this is what happens to floozies. Um, he pushed himself too hard. Uh, this is a classic of my parents, which I think also sort of occurs in your book, where that your grandmother had something to say about it. Oh, right. My grandmother thought that there were only a certain number of steps that you are allotted in life, so you really should be careful about using them up, which is why we don't come from an exercise no. family. <laughs> Well, also in my family, they were just like, why take chances? Yeah. You know? <laughs> Get up. Get, Stay yeah. in the chair where Stay everything's safe. Stay in the safe. chair. You know things are good in the chair. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Basically, why ask for trouble? You know? Well, my mother is 92 now, and I said, Mom, you should walk around a little. She said, you know I've always hated walking. <laughs> <laughs> she was never the same after that crackpot diet. I heard that one a lot. And then the last one. He moved to Florida, and five minutes later, boom, he was dead. <laughs> that was that, yeah, the last um, place we were was Miami. <laughs> that yeah, was that, was, that was a little interesting. Um, <laughs> yeah, I hadn't realized that. And um, this... Uh, <laughs> I, I, get, I get asked sometimes, like, where do you get your ideas for cartoons? And a lot of times, I really I could not tell you. But this one actually did come directly from life. When my daughter was around 16, she was in the living room, and she was doing her math homework, and she was listening to some like hip hop music on the boom, the boom box, and, uh, which tells you a little bit like approximately what era this was from. And, uh, you know, there's nothing more horrible in the eyes of a teenager than an adult human body. Um, and, and I really agree with that. But if you want to, you know, put a cherry on top of that horrible Sunday, just do a little kind of, you know, dance. And uh, I, I, came in, I came into the living room just to kind of see if she was paying attention and did this little dance. And she looked up and she said, Mom, stop. You're hurting me. <laughs> Uh, and I asked her if I could use it in a cartoon, and she said, OK. So now we are, we open it up to the conversation. Right? Uh, right. I don't want to stop looking at the no. cartoons. But so um, did your mother really say that about Which the eulogy? One? She did. She was very concerned about the grammar, she especially, was? yeah. OK. Yeah. All right. And did, she knows it's the title of the book. She does. So she owns but, it. But she, I told her, and she sort of paused and go, Mom, it's funny. Everyone laughs. She goes, well, all right. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that what your mother say when you write and then you make the cartoons, it's hysterical. But as you're growing up and your mothers are saying these things to you, are they acknowledged as funny or are they just funny later? Or how does that work? My mother has a lot of irony. So she's delivered them as true, but, but, but phrased ironically. Um, I uh, didn't literally take notes, but you know, the great thing about being a writer is, OK, this may, the worse this is, the easier it is to write. Yeah. <laughs> so you're kind of gathering stuff all the time. Um, I, I once lived with friends, a couple, and she was a writer, and he wasn't. And, every, and he would say things like, 
I'm going to say something. Is I'm going to say something now, and I don't want this to appear in anyone's novel. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I like one of my favorite quotes about writing is um, I know I'm going to botch the pronunciation of his name, and I really should look it up. Um, but uh, he's a Polish poet named. Uh, 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 Czes Czeslaw Milos, and he has this great quote, which is um, that when a writer is born into a family, the family is finished. <laughs> and, uh, I think that's really pretty true. So, so both of you, and you've written about your mother, Roz, have very strong, formidable mothers. But you had very different childhoods. Yours was in Brooklyn. Yours was in Long Island. Talk about oh, the same Philadelphia. Thing. Sorry. Same thing. <laughs> Apologies. Talk about the similarities and the differences in your childhoods. Well, we both did have very strong-willed mothers. Um, judgmental. Yep. Opinionated. Uh, not shy about sharing their opinions. Right, no, and they wouldn't call them opinions, they would call them truths. <laughs> yes, exactly, that would help you grow because your feelings are not that important. Right. Um, yeah. And, you know, and being sort of like, you know, a little bit downcast or sad, you know, with my mother, if I, you know, tried, dared to express these kind of things, it would be like, stop staring at your navel, or, you know, I'll give you something to complain about, you know, so, um, and, and it's understandable, you know, considering her background, it was like, what did I have to complain about? I had, you know, I ha lived, you know, had a roof over my head and um, food and, you know, you know, who was I to say that this was like, oh, sad, sad me, you know, mm -hmm. so. But we were, we were, were um, remarking to each other that though we had very dissimilar uh, backgrounds in many ways, I was suburban Philadelphia, I discovered early on the word bourgeois, and I used it a lot. Oh, God, I'm so bourgeois. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to go live somewhere where it wasn't bourgeois. <laughs> and I mean, truly, it was bourgeois. I was signed up for anything that had a carpool. But, and yet, and, and my parents were about a decade younger than yours, I guess. So that or maybe more. Maybe more? My parents were born in 1912. Magna Carta, why? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, 1839. Yeah. So, right. And yet, it, there was sort of the same values. And if, if my parents had been placed yeah. in your environment, yes. they might have been the same thing. Yeah. I mean, and I, there were certain things that they were very. Both of them, you know, the, the grammar thing, they were, I know with my parents, because they were teachers. My mother was actually, she had been a teacher for decades, and then she, you know, finally became an assistant principal, um, which suited her to a T. Uh, <laughs> my father was a teacher, and so, but they were both children of immigrants who barely spoke English, and so it was very important to them that, I think it was more than just to assimilate. It was just to become a good person. You did not say words like irregardless. Mm -hmm. And you know, to this day, when I hear somebody, like especially you know, a newscaster on TV, I just want to like go there and like you know, cut their head off. It's like you don't get to talk anymore. You know, never mind on TV. You just you don't get to talk ever again. We have a um, we have a. a, a cartoon and, and caption of my mother um, truly did keep a, a ledger by her bed of all of the gr grammar mistakes that the news cast. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, written, tell yeah. me the book. Oh, I can't. Did, she, did yeah. she call in or did she just no, keep no, the ledger? Your yeah. mother was a depression denier. Is she that true? Well, my mother, I, I think unlike Raz's mother, she, you were, were never supposed to complain, ever. I mean, she complained to me about herself, and she certainly complained to me about me. But to the <laughs> world, you were positive. And, and even, like, she told me if you go to the doctor and they say, is there history of this in the family, history of this, history of this, you say, no, no, no. And, and I would go, like, 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 any problems? No. And I always thought, they must think the Marxists were all murdered because there's no way to explain their death. And my father, <laughs> my father once said, well, during the Depression, and my mother said, Dick, 
don't complain. There was no depression. <laughs> he was just like, no, everything was perfect. Let's talk a little bit about the process, because you started collaborating, as you showed us early on, and you've collaborated on several works. Yeah. How does it work? How does, how do you, when do you draw the cartoons? What is your role in that? Tell us how the process works. Well, uh, one of us will have an idea, and we'll say, OK, let's do that. And then right. usually I start, and I have some kind of a text, and uh, then Roz makes suggestions, then Roz goes off and draws, and I make suggestions, and it's, it's yeah. suspiciously easy. Yeah, it's We fun. always agree about, about things. Mo we mostly do. And also, we're good enough friends that if something isn't completely right, you know, we can tell each other, you know, this, I think it could be better, like, why don't you try phrasing it like this, or... Yeah. Uh, but we really, we've collaborated on a lot of things since that very first illustration, and, and it's, it's fun. It is suspiciously fun, because you know how I feel about fun. <laughs> you know? Like nature. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> well, you know... Something's wrong, we're having yeah. a good time. Yeah, exactly. So you never come up with something, and Patricia, you say, oh, God, that's not what I had in mind at all. That's just... Does that ever happen? Roz is so good that no. But I will say, or I, I, maybe you should put it that way, or maybe yeah. I can add, tweak it a little bit. And yeah, yeah, thing, yeah. yeah. And then I, uh, with this book and some other books, maybe have overwritten it. So we sit down together, in this case with our editor, and we just said, OK, let's limit it to, let's take out that one. Yeah. But we never really have disagreed about anything, I think. Yeah, I mean, I mean it's real. I've collaborated. It, Collaborations are interesting because mostly when I do cartoons, when I draw cartoons, I would say 100% 100, 100 of my cartoons are like not collaborative. But these other projects, you know, when I illustrate something for somebody, uh, they're collaborative. And it really varies from case to case. There are times where like I get a manuscript or I get an article and I illustrate it and maybe the editor might make a couple of suggestions or not. Um, but then there is other times where I've been involved in a project and there's a lot of back and forth. Like sometimes um, Patty will make a suggestion to be a, me about a drawing um, or I might make suggestions to her about a write, the writing. It's not quite, you know, the, the border between the drawing and the writing, it's just much more porous. And I think that's partly what makes it fun because mm -hmm. it's a real collaboration. It's not just, um, you know, here's a thing, here's the illustration, blah. But yeah. it's also very defined roles, you know. It's not like TV or movies, which I've worked with, and the collaborative is like we're both doing the same thing. Right, we're doing different things. Yeah. On my first job, I had a writing partner. It was for Saturday Night Live. And I love this writing partner. And we, we did everything, everything, like, you know, like pretty much said the sentence together. And then I went off to work by myself. And I thought, it wasn't really good starting out as a, in collaboration, because I had no confidence that I could do it myself. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was kind of, I wish I had started the other way around. I mean, I caught up to where I'd be anyway. But it was, and when you're collaborating in TV or movies, you can kind of just look thoughtful and think, he's coming up with that. I'll just <laughs> pretend I'm working. <laughs> and, and, it, yeah. and you don't get that when you're alone in a room. So I have to ask about The New Yorker, because you've written for The New Yorker, and obviously, Roz, you're in The New Yorker all the time. Roz, do you ever uh, submit a cartoon to The New Yorker that they reject? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that, like, 95% of what I do is rejected. Oh, come on. No, no, no. The, the way I think that people don't understand what, what being a cartoonist That's The New shocking. Yorker is. Basically, what happens is... There's about 40 people who are staff cartoonists. There's, I don't know how many people who submit who aren't staff cartoonists. There are about like 15 or 20 slots per issue, maybe 15 these days. But each one of us, let's say these 40 staff people, we submit, and this has been what it's been like since 1978. Is this like making like a weird sound? Not okay. to anybody else, weird sound? No. Okay, bless me. Oh, okay, good. Um, so uh, I guess it's inside my head. Um, <laughs> Can anybody else hear voices? <laughs> that, that shrill screaming? Oh, it's my mother. <laughs> um, 
so, I mean, starting from like 1978, when I started, we submit, it's called The Batch. And The Batch is, you submit a group of cartoons every week, not one. You submit, um, you know, anywhere from, I know there are people that would submit like two or three to like, I usually shoot for between six and eight. There's people who send in, me, you know, 10 or 12 or- A week? Yeah, every week, <laughs> every single week. This is what you do. Also, there's no guarantee of sales. I've never been on a salary. It's really per cartoon. So sometimes you sell, sometimes you don't sell. So I have filing cabinets that are, they're actually full at this point, and now I have the rejects you know, piled on top of the filing cabinets. And so I have thousands of rejected cartoons, but people say, well, what do you do with them? Sometimes, if I have an idea that I really, really love, I resubmit it. It's not like, yeah, I'm pulling you know, the wool over somebody's eyes. This is what we do. Usually, when I resubmit it, almost always I um, rework it in some way. Because if I really like an idea and I believe in it, I think you know, it's my fault that I didn't put it across the best way to do it and so I have to like shorten it or if it's a, you know something with boxes maybe there are, I could put them in a better order it gives me a chance to kind of rethink it I, I make a note on the back of the cartoon telling me when I've submitted it so I can see oh okay uh, I've submitted this you know after maybe five rejections it's it's done but occasionally <laughs> I'll sell a cartoon that I've, you know, it's like the third or fourth reiteration of this idea. And I'll see like the first time it was like 93 and then maybe in 97 and maybe 2007 and then I submitted in 2011. And finally in 2019 maybe I sold a sort of like version of it. And that's really very satisfying. So what yeah. about what about when you get a cover? I mean, is that just like, oh, oh my God. Yeah, it's still best. totally exciting. But, but I mean, the whole... For me, it is the best. I, you know, not again to like sound so happy, but um, <laughs> you know, the fact that I can do what I love for a living, you know, is is it's crucial because I really can't do anything else, especially by this point. I mean, you know, we can't even find our way to the the, the restroom. No, we. I mean, yeah, I can't. I can't completely speak for Patty, but I am like an extremely incompetent person in every other <laughs> walk of life. So um, if, I, if I did not have this to do, I don't know what I would be doing. Maybe, I don't even think, I've never worked a cash register. I would be like terrified of it. Um, so I hear um, you're pretty good at crossword puzzles. If, there were, if I could do that for a living, that would <laughs> maybe be a different thing. So what about your mother's opinions of your work? You talked about that a little bit, um, Patty. Why don't we start with you, Roz, and then chime in, please. Um, I, think my, I think my parents were both extremely proud. I mean, they, they subscribed to The New Yorker, their friends subscribed to The New Yorker, so they knew that um, it was good. You know, it was a good thing to appear in The New Yorker. It was like, you know, certainly better than like the penny saver or something. Um, uh, but I, I think that also because they were so much older and from a whole different world, they, we did not, completely overlap as far as senses of humor went. Uh, you know, they liked very structured jokes. They liked, you know, in fact, my mother, my father didn't really tell the jokes. My mother was the person, and they would always have like uh, dinner parties at their house that they'd invite all of these teachers that they knew. And I remember being in my bedroom and I would hear them all telling jokes. You know, it'd be like, you know, at this dinner party, be like, I got a new one. Okay, a guy goes to the doctor, <laughs> da, 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 yeah. punchline, you know, uproarious laughter, and then like, oh, I have one too, you know, like Mrs. Schlemansky and, you know, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And, and that's what they would do. But, I, you know, I think about the joke thing, and like, I can't remember the la I can't remember ever being at a dinner party where somebody told a joke. Not you know. intentionally. <laughs> Not in yeah, exactly, exactly. Like, made everybody shut up so yeah. they could, like, tell the jokes. But that's what they, so it was a different sense of humor, but I, I think they were. They were glad. And Patty? Well, first, I'll, I'll get to that, but first, my parents, my mother said she didn't have time for jokes. It was like, she didn't even have time for, for the middle of a story. It was like, just tell me, is it good or bad for you, as soon as I would say something. That's but, funny. Um, my uh, parents were also extremely proud. But, you know, it's just, 
if I had robbed a bank and I was in the newspaper, my mother would brag about it. <laughs> Did you see? Front page. Yeah. Above the fold. <laughs> There's Patty. <laughs> but she had, I, when I wrote my first novel, I showed her the galley um, the day it was too late to make changes. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, she said, can you change the name Sugar? I don't want to be related to a sugar. And I said, yeah, but it's a novel. She goes, yeah, right, uh-huh, just change it. And it, she had a point. I mean, it was a novel, novel. It was about me, and she was... She also told me once, um, when I was sort of not being productive, why don't you write about your family? Um, you know, that's what people do. And I said, well, I could do that, but you, uh, you'd be included and you might not come out great. And she said, if it makes money. <laughs> <laughs> she also told me in my first novel that I should put uh, the name of her hairdresser in, and I did. Oh, really? And he put a poster in his salon. Did she get a discount? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how much of your humor is Jewish, do you think? Oh, mm, it's interesting. You should answer that. Uh, I say that because Roz is working on an essay about yeah. it. Oh, yeah, a okay. friend of mine is putting together a book of Jewish cartoons. Oh. And uh, I am, I'm writing the in introductory. So you've been thinking about this. Or, yeah. I. I <laughs> Either like none or everything. Um, I'm, uh, I, it's really hard to step outside yourself, I think, and and you know m say that for sure. But I, I bet there's a lot to it. So um, much of humor is Jewish humor. Right. That it's, yeah. It makes it hard. I mean, I would say I'm. I'm certainly my humor is not wasp humor. Yeah. But I'm not sure and then you throw New York in there too, and yeah. there's sort of a. Yeah. But Something. but it's not. Oh, I think there's a certain ex, to a certain extent it's uni, uni, I hope it's maybe universal. I don't know. I don't know. Um, Can you tell us more about that book that's coming out, or is it? Uh, that, it's just a. Uh, it's not mine. It's um, but it's a collection of uh, Jewish humor slash cartoons by uh, the former editor of uh, cartoon editor of the New Yorker, Bob Mankoff. Oh, so, great! Yeah. Oh, great. Um, so we're going to come to the audience for questions, so please get your questions ready, because this is a great opportunity, and we hope you won't be shy. But before we do, um, I know everybody's wondering about your fathers. And you wrote about your father a little, Roz, in Can't We Talk About Something More Pleasant. But um, do you want to tell us a little bit about your father and how he fit into this family and what his role was? My mother took care of him. <laughs> <laughs> he was more sentimental. Then my mother, um, he, uh, one, one thing comes to mind. Uh, but my father was kind of, and same with Raza's father with her, he was sort of my play buddy. I mean, we would, we would go to the library many times a week. He would, we would play tennis uh, after he came back from work uh, in the summer almost every night. He would, um, we did a lot of stuff together. Uh, my mother was too busy with the carpool, I guess. And um, my father, as I said, was sentimental. One time he, we were driving down Chestnut Street in Philadelphia, and my father said, he was pretty old at this time, and he said, something I want you to know before I die. And that's like not the kind of way we talked in my house. I don't think, oh, this is so embarrassing. <laughs> that never park in that parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's a ripoff. That's so funny. Very important. <laughs> Yes. So, Roz, you said there was nothing else you could do besides cartoons, but I know there's something else you can both do. So we have a little surprise for you now. Very few people get this surprise, but uh, Roz and Patty are going to serenade us. <laughs> After which, we'll have it open for audience questions. So when they're done, please just put up their hands and they'll call on you. So we'll explain a little bit about yeah. why we have these ukuleles, uh, in case you don't know what a famous band we are. We're called the Ucular Meltdown. <laughs> <laughs> we used to be the Daily Pukaleles. That was that became the Weekly Pukaleles, the Monthly Pukaleles, and then and the Never Pukaleles. We did that with our 
two of our friends who we had to get rid of because they had talent. And we don't, yeah. we don't believe in that. No. And it's the pandering. reason we, we started was I was invited to a wedding, and the guest, it was the, uh, at the solar eclipse, and the guest was going to serenade, um, not the guest, the group, anybody who could play an instrument was going to serenade the guests and to, here comes the sun. So I bought this one. I don't play any instrument, which will become very obvious to you. Um, and I bought this cute, cute little ukulele on Amazon for $49. And? And Patty said, this is the most fun thing in the world, Roz. You have to get one. So I saw the picture of it, and I said, yes, indeed, I do have to get one. <laughs> and the little shark here, and this cute, cute color, and it was just like, this is as cute as a parakeet. I clearly need to have it. Um, and then I started playing it. I said, this, you are absolutely right. We just love it so much. Yeah, so. so our specialty is public domain songs. That is our little <laughs> niche. And, um, and Patty rewrote a song which may be familiar to some of you. Uh, it's to the tune of P.S. I Love You. Okay. Okay. On your mark, get set, go. As I do your laundry, though you're 22, remember that I'll always be the boss of you. Did I mention starting now? You're grounded, cause all your pot, I found it. P.S. I love you. I die, dear. Put down your damn phone. <laughs> phone, phone, phone. Yeah. Rose off the table. Mouth shut when you chew. Remember that one day soon you'll have kids like you. Whatever, eat all your peas forever. P.S. I love you. You, you, you. And we're going to um, play one little short short song. It's about um, having your mother in the car when you're driving. Okay. <laughs> well, on your mark, get set, go. Park, park, park your car, kind of near the curb. ay 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 you just bumped into her. I guess we'll go down this way. I'll take those oh. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? So Jessica, Thanks. please put up your hand if you have a question. And oh. Jessica will come to you with the microphone. Yes. I'll take this. Okay. This. Oops. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. A brief question for each of you. Patty, um, do you know roughly of the 47 issues a year of, of the magazine, uh, about how many submittals there are for a Shouts and Murmurs page? Brilliance. <laughs> Brilliant. I don't know. Um, a lot. Thousands. Yeah. Um, okay. I don't, I don't know how many, but a lot. All right. Well, that's, that's depressing. Sorry. Okay. And, 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 <laughs> and to make you feel better if you get rejected. That's true. Um, uh, Roz, um, are you contractually pr prohibited? from submitting anything that was submitted to the magazine, whether it was used or not, to any other publication? No, no. Okay. They have, it's a first refusals arrangement. So I, I see. Have, yeah. But obviously, if it runs, you can't send it elsewhere. Um, I wouldn't send it elsewhere. But people, you know, with permission, they use reprints. OK. You know? All right. Thank you.
So I know that you have a daughter, and it sounds from your humor that you might have a daughter too? I know, I'm too young to have kids. Oh. <laughs> I'm too short to have kids. So oh. No, I don't have kids. Well, you've talked a little bit about what your mothers think of your work, and I was wondering if you dare to be so bold as to tell us what your daughter thinks of it. Um, well, I have, I have two kids, and I think that they think I'm funny. I think that they're really funny, and they like funny things, so I've been really lucky that, you know, I have kids with senses of humor. And, uh, yeah. This is a question for Roz. How did your hooked rug motherboard come to be on the cover um, of the it, New Yorker? It was, that was actually uh, embroidery. Um, yeah, it's not a, it wasn't one of the hooked rugs. It was a embroidery. Um, I got kind of, I, I, I get obsessed with crafts now and then. And I, just, I knew how to. I learned how to embroider in sixth grade. I had a teacher that made us all embroider a map of the United States. Um, and uh, even boys. And I remember it was like really fun, you know, it was weird. And uh, anyway, I just kind of got into embroidering. And uh, Francoise Mouly, who's the covers editor of The New Yorker, um, she, she said that there was an issue coming up that was the uh, it was the tech issue, and it was also coincidental with Mother's Day. Um, so uh, I, I started doodling and thinking about things, and um, I thought of a motherboard, you know. And then I wanted to, uh, I decided I wanted to embroider it because it seemed like a fun thing to embroider, because it's a fun thing. I like drawing robots, I like, uh, you know. I just, it just seemed like it would be a fun thing to embroider. So I researched, um, I, I suggested that to her, and she said, go for it. And I, I did a few sketches you know, on paper. And then once we had worked that out, um, I transferred it to the thing and, and embroidered it. It was really nuts. It just you know, it took hours, uh, billions of hours. And apparently, it was a real bitch to photograph, because <laughs> um, you know, they had never photographed a, a piece of um, like cloth, kind of like a project, an embroidered thing, and they had to light it and experiment with different ways of lighting it. Um, somebody actually asked me whether it was an app, <laughs> like <laughs> to make like a drawing look like embroidery, and it was like, uh, I wish. Um, <laughs> well, <mate. it> was, <laughs> yeah, um, I, so that's how that came about. Um, can, can you tell us a little bit about when you realized you could draw and your environment? I, I'm presuming you work at home. They don't have an office for you at the New Yorker if you're No, I don't think any writers or artists have a office. Yeah. Office. So can you just uh, tell us a little bit about when you realized you could draw things? I mean, this is, this is not Van Gogh kind of sketching. It isn't? Well, <laughs> it's, you know, well, it's, it's go maybe, like maybe it would be in the Van Gogh Museum someday. But uh, tell, tell us a little bit when you realized you could put these things down on paper and describe your working environment in, your, in the room where you produce this work. Um, okay. I, I, I don't, I mean, I, I think for, I, for me, I always, I just always drew. Um, and I think it was uh, um, partly that I, I, you know, partly that I was an only child and my parents were a lot older and paper, and I lived, I grew up in an apartment. So bouncing a ball was like out of the question. Um, and drawing was something that was kind of quiet. It was, uh, you know, something you could do in an apartment. And also, like, if you were out to dinner with your parents at, like, the Chinese restaurant on Coney Island Avenue, they could, like, you know, you, if, it, if they gave me paper and pencil, that would keep me quiet. And they could talk like grown-ups. Um, so I just drew from the time I was really, really little. And then I guess nobody stopped me. So um, I, kept, I kept doing it. Uh, 
I just always really liked to draw. And as I said before, it was the only thing that I, I could do. Um, my working environment at home, I have a studio. It's just really very basic. I have a drafting table and supplies and filing cabinets full of rejects and stacks of pads of paper. I mean, I still draw mostly on paper, but I also, in the last couple of years, have fallen like seriously in love with my iPad uh, with an Apple Pencil. It's just so much fun. Um, but I just, I just always like to draw. Just a quick follow-up. Is that ink or pencil? It's, it's, I start with a pencil sketch, and then I ink over the pencil and the grays are wash. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Laura from PS32 in the Bronx. Hi, Roz from PS217 in Brooklyn. Excellent. <laughs> uh, sorry about the Dodgers. Uh, my niece uh, texted me yesterday and she said she should have remembered and instead of should have remembered. How long do I have to wait to respond? respond. Go back in time. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think that's as cardinal of a sin as like irregardless. It's pretty bad. Though. It's bad. It's yeah, bad. I, especially I, if you write it. Oh. Yeah, she wrote it. Oh, that's not. Oh, that's yeah. That's not just in speech. Wow. Hmm. Yeah. Well, maybe there's some way you could make a joke out of it or something. Like just circle the of like this and like ha 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 ha. Like. <laughs> 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 my my grandma my grandma my mother is always correcting my niece and nephew and they so my niece said to me when she was little she says I forget what the the specifics were but she says something like, or as Grammy would say and then she and then she did it correctly <laughs> she was like me and him or, or as oh. Grammy would say <laughs> oh God so um, uh, Patricia I read your article about emotional support animals in yes. New Yorker and. That's I thought that was one of the funniest articles, anything I've read in my life. and One of the most fun, embarrassing experiences of my life. I was wondering about the alpaca in Manhattan. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't take it to alpaca, I didn't take it to Manhattan. We went to um, the Olana, which is Frederick Church's historic home, and we took it to bars, and we took it, it to... It was in Manhattan, where was it? It was in near Hudson, New York. But it, this was a, I did a piece on emotional support animals a few years ago, and I took five very strange animals, places they don't ordinarily go. Uh, you know, I took the snake to Chanel to get it, to get an accessory. I took a, a pig on the plane, and I took it to the Ritz for tea and rolled it in, and some woman said, Excuse me, but your baby is oinking. <laughs> <laughs> and I took this alpaca, which looks like, I don't know if any of you have seen an alpaca, it looks like you stole it from F.A.O. Schwartz. It's the cutest thing in the world. But do not let looks deceive you because it, it kicks and it's like really not behaved that well. And I had to take it to this historic home where, as the guard pointed out, we can't take, we, we, first they said, well, you can't take this in because there are 2,000 historic objects. And I was kind of relieved. <laughs> and then they came running in and said, we talked to the guy in Albany, like they had talked to the <laughs> Washington. Oz. And then, yeah, and they, you can the take it in. And I'm like, oh. Because <laughs> like, hearing that you're livestock is, it, you can take it in where 2,000 objects will be ruined. So I take it in and don't ask me anything about Frederick Church's historic home because I was all just thinking, oh, please, please, please. And as soon as we get in, the tail goes up, which means it has to go to the bathroom <laughs> and it starts beeping. So that was Alana. It was... Hello. Do you PS11 Queens? <laughs> and my yeah. grandchildren went to PS11 Brooklyn. Wow. Huh. Anybody here from Santa Rosa? <laughs> <laughs> no, they're not allowed in. 
I wonder if you remember, probably do, when you got your first paycheck, each of you for your, for your work, each of you for your works, and what you did with the money. I don't remember what I did with the money, but I do remember, well, my first paycheck for a cartoon. Oh, well, OK. Um, when I got out of, uh, I went to um, art school, and when I got out of art school, I never thought I was going to be able to make a living as a cartoonist, because my cartoons were just too, they didn't fit in anywhere. I, I just really, I thought I was going to, maybe if I were lucky, I would uh, be an illustrator. Um, and I had this like really weird, like cooked up, sort of horrible style, just a sort of pastiche of what I thought was trending at the time. And, but I would do cartoons for myself um, that I just didn't show to anybody. And finally, I had this kind of funny experience where I was on the subway. And across from me was this magazine. And um, I, it was Christopher Street magazine, which was, uh, if I had to sum it up, it was, it's a gay magazine with like literary, sort of like a gay New Yorker magazine, meaning that it was not like anything like porny or anything like that. Um, but they used cartoons. And as I was flipping through it, and, I, and there were, appeared to be like three different artists, which I found out later was one person who drew in three styles and had three <laughs> pseudonyms, um, or one real name and two pseudonyms. And I took it as a sign. I thought, all right, I'm going to call this magazine. And if I can start selling cartoons, maybe I should really give it a try to become a cartoonist. And I did. They paid me 10 bucks. So that's why like, I really don't remember what I did with that money. <laughs> um, but that was probably in the fall sometime in 77. But in April of 1978, I, and then I had started su su uh, submitting cartoons to uh, the National Lampoon, where I was selling, and also to the Village Voice. Um, I never thought I was going to be a cartoonist for The New Yorker, but I knew that they used cartoons. So in April of 78, I gathered up what I had, which was probably about 60 cartoons. And um, I, went, I, found, I called them up. I found out when their drop-off day was, which was you know, when people who uh, you know, just are, submit over the transom, kind of. Um, and uh, I went back the next week and, uh, you know, to pick up my portfolio fully expecting to see you know, a, reject, a rejection note in there. And instead, there was a note from Lee Lorenz, who was the art editor, or the cartoon editor and art editor. And he said to come back and see him. And they bought a cartoon. So I do remember that you know, extremely well. And I remember there was a bank of phones uh, in, the, in the lobby of the building. And I called my parents. And I told them I'd sell the cartoon. Uh, $250, which was my rent. So, and it, it was uh, grown up money, you know? So, and, they, and he told me to start coming back every week, which is basically, you know, what I do, except now I submit it electronically, not in person. But. And I did a lot of TV uh, before I did print, and my first job, astonishingly, was as a writer for Saturday Night Live. Uh, and I got a ton of money. I, I mean, I couldn't believe it. I had been a graduate student in England, and I was pretty sure, and I was trying to write my dissertation, and I was pretty sure that I was going to, like, die doing that. Like, you'd say, go, see that woman? She's 89 years old now, and she's been here for a long time. <laughs> and I came back from, from uh, England one summer, and, and uh, heard that they were taking applicants for Saturday Night Live. And I applied. And um, I remember the producer said, it was a Friday, do you think you could write three sketches by Monday? And I thought, I couldn't write three sketches in 10 years, but sure. <laughs> and I wrote these sketches, and I was home. And I heard my parents having this conversation. Did you see those sketches? Yes. They were terrible. <laughs> yes, they were terrible. What is she going to do? She doesn't have a graduate degree. What is she going to do? And I, I got the job. And weirdly, I found out later that it wasn't the sketch. The sketches were kind of terrible. But I had submitted like doodles. 
and little things I'd been working on instead of doing my dissertation. And that's why I um, was selected. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, I want to remind you that Roz and Patty will be signing their books in the lobby. What a wonderful afternoon. Thanks so much to all of you for coming, and thanks to Roz Patty. <laughs>